sustaining small rural and community businesses, smart communities and remote working. This committee has already met several government departments, agencies, representative bodies and other, uh, other bodies on the theme of sustaining small rural and community businesses and we are delighted to have Enterprise Ireland and Offaly County Council's Leo with us this morning. The committee has also considered the implications of Brexit on communities in rural and urban Ireland. We, we would be interested to hear about how we might mitigate the effects of Brexit. Investment in rural broadband and digital technologies opens up opportunities for rural Ireland. At the last meeting of the committee on the 6th of February 2019, we discussed smart communities and remote working with Minister of State Deputy Sean Kenny at the Department of Rural Community Development and Grow Remote. With us today are Abodu, uh, who have worked with Wexford County Council in preparing a talent heat map uh, for County Wexford. They are also involved in local hubs, Enterprise Ireland, local authorities and LEOs in encouraging local employment. Trilly HQ are also with us today and we have an interesting story about their successes with co-working hubs in Trilly and Listowel in County Kerry. On behalf of the committee, we would like to welcome the following witnesses to the, me uh, to the meeting today. Uh, Mark Christel um, from Enterprise Ireland, uh, Michael Birmingham, Rowena Dwyer, um, all from Enterprise Ireland, representatives from um, County Offaly, Leo, Anne-Marie uh, Delaney, Orla Martin and Geraldine Byrne. Representatives from Abodu, uh, Vanessa Tierney and Louise O'Connor. Representatives from HQ, uh, Tralee and Tralee Chamber of Commerce, uh, Mr Ken Tobin. At the outset, I remind members, staff, witnesses and those in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phones. Uh, mobile phones interfere with the sound system so, and they make it very difficult to, to um, I suppose, report on the meeting. So just to check if your mobile phones are off, please. And also in relation to the microphones which are situated in front of you, make sure that it's not, there's nothing really obstructing them. Um, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect to the evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the Chairman to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way to make him, her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. It is proposed that any submissions or opening statements or other documents submitted by witnesses to the committee for this meeting be published on the committee's website. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. I now call on Mark Christel of Enterprise Ireland to make his opening statement. You're very welcome. Chairman, thank you. Um, um, Chairman and committee members, uh, to begin I would like to thank the committee for inviting me here today to speak to you. I am joined by my colleagues Mick Braham, Regional Director for the Midlands and Mid-East, and Rowena Dwyer, Manager, Manager of our Policy, Planning and Corporate Relations Department. Um, what I intend to do, Chairman, is just to use the statement as, as a brief and just to go through it, not, not, not in full, but to pick out I think the key points. Um, Enterprise Ireland's primary remit is to support Indigenous companies engaged in manufacturing and internationally traded service, services. The agency also also has responsibility for foreign direct investment in the food and natural resources area. The majority of the companies that Enterprise Ireland works with are small and medium enterprises. Through a national network of 10 offices, the agency works with these companies to assist them to start, grow, innovate, grow their business, target and secure export sales in international markets and strengthen their competitiveness. These companies cross a wide range of sectors and are lo located in every county throughout the country. Enterprise Ireland works in partnership with a, a wide range of, uh, ex of enterprise development partners to support our regional enterprise development agenda, including the local enterprise offices, the business incubation centres, the Design and Crafts Council, uh, which, of which funding comes through Enterprise Ireland. In addition, upon direction from government, the agency administers funding schemes to non-agency clients, such as the online retail scheme launched by the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation in late 2018, to support eligible SMEs in the retail sector to develop a more competitive online offer. 
Reflecting uh, the strength of the Irish economy and of global markets in 2018, Enterprise Ireland companies reported strong employment performance. In 2018, the Employment Survey reported the highest employment in the history of the agency, with 215,207 people employed in Enterprise Ireland supported companies. 9,119 new jobs were created after losses are taken into account, and employment growth across all regions. Our clients play an important role in the regional economy. For example, in 2018, 64% of employment was in client companies located outside of Dublin, and 61% of new jobs reported were created in companies located outside of Dublin. So Enterprise Ireland supported companies sustain over 375,000 direct and indirect jobs nationwide. The total spend in the, in the economy from Enterprise Ireland clients across payroll and goods and services purchased reached 26.7 billion in 2017. Through our network of 33 international offices, we have assisted client companies to increase their exports to a record 22.7 billion in 2017, a growth of 7 percent compared to 2016 exporting results. Importantly, Enterprise Ireland clients are increasingly diversifying their global footprint beyond the United Kingdom. In terms of our work with client companies, we work under a number of key pillars. The first is we, su we support startup companies, uh, and we've provided detail in our statement of the full range of supports there. But worth noting that Enterprise Ireland New Frontiers Development Programme, the National Entrepreneur Development Programme for Early Startups, is run in partnership with 14 institutes of technology throughout the country. And between 2016 and 2018, Enterprise Ireland has supported 496 entrepreneurs across the country <coughs> on this programme. In terms of innovation, it's essential for companies to be competitive internationally and to win market share, and Enterprise Ireland is working with clients to drive innovation activity via a number of supports. In market diversification, we actively work with companies with global ambition to internationalise and in doing so to diversify their global foot footprint. Competitiveness is critical for companies to scale and internationalise and to assist client companies stay ahead of competition. In 2018, Enterprise Ireland launched an Operation Excellence offer. This offer supports established SMEs to target a whole of company transformation, including capital investment, business innovation and training. But there are some challenges that we're, that, that we're obviously very mindful of. The outcome of the Brexit negotiations remains uncertain. It is going to result in increased cost and trade disruptions for both exporting and importing companies. And to support client companies navigate potential challenges, Enterprise Ireland has engaged in a programme of building resilience in Irish exporting companies focused on innovation, market diversification and competitiveness, and addressing the awareness and preparedness of companies to Brexit. Being prepared for Brexit is critical for companies as long-term structural and disruptive change will emerge. To promote awareness and supported by a, na a national Prepare for Brexit campaign, Enterprise Ireland has developed, a, a, a developed and launched a Brexit SME scorecard, which is an interactive online platform which can be used by all companies to self-assess their exposure to Brexit under six business pillars. And to date, over 4,435 companies have utilised the scorecard. And we've also launched the Be Prepared grant that supports the cost of SME clients up to 5,000 in preparing a plan, a plan to mitigate risks and optimise opportunities opportunities arise from Brexit. To date, 156 companies have approved f for support under this initiative. Enterprise Ireland client companies are taking action to prepare for Brexit. A September 2017 survey reported that 38% of clients surveyed had taken Brexit actions. In May 2018, this figure had increased to 85% of client companies surveyed. The survey reported that client companies are taking action in such areas as market diversification, developing strategic partnerships, improving operational competitiveness, improving financial management and strengthening business in the UK. Skills remains a, a, a key focus of, 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 of Enterprise Ireland, and investment in skills and human capital is critical to drive innovation, competitiveness and diversification in Irish business. As the economy approaches full employment, the challenges of matching enterprise skill needs with available labour supply comes into great focus. In partnership with the Department of Education and Skills and the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation, the agency is supporting client companies to identify and address the critical skill needs. In terms of supporting enterprise development with, with, with the regions, our key priority is to ensure that all regions throughout the country are growing optimally based on their innate and unique strengths and capabilities. In this way, jobs will be sustained and created, jobs will be future-proofed and the reach of the agency's client base will be expanded. Within an Enterprise Ireland context, there are three components of this. Firstly, to support client companies to grow in all regions. Secondly, to build a regional infrastructure that can support enterprise activity, including co-working, and harnessing the the enterprise potential of regions and the entrepreneurial assets within them. 
Enterprise Ireland has made a significant investment in supporting the establishment of infrastructure that can house enterprise activity in regions throughout the country, and details of which are, are presented in our, in our submission, but include the National Network of Business Innovation Centres and Specialist Bioincubation Facilities, the Community Enterprise Centres, the Regional Accelerators and the Business Innovation Centres that, that we're supporting, as well as noting the Community Enterprise Initiative and the 32 projects received funding to support public and private community enterprise initiatives. The investment detailed has resulted in an increased capacity of regions to offer co-working spaces. Co-working facilities have an important role to play in the rebalancing of regional growth throughout the country. The facilities can help regions retain skills and talent and can assist companies with skills retention. The ability of these workers to remain in their locality, in their locality daily has a, both a positive economic and social impact in their locality. Under Enterprise Ireland's Regional Enterpri Enterprise Development Fund, the agency has approved £60 million in investment to 42 projects lo located throughout the country. This competitive fund, provided by the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation through Enterprise Ireland, is a key action to support the Regional Action Plan for Jobs, the Regional Enterprise Plans and the Action Plan for Rural Development. In line with the agency's investment in regions to date, corporate strategy and national enterprise and regional development policy, the agency will undertake initiatives that will foster an environment where jobs will be created and sustained in regions, allowing people to live and work in their local area. Such initiatives will include fostering increased resilience and productivity within client companies throughout all regions to enhance productivity and agility to respond to economic shocks such as those from any kind of Brexit, balancing regional development in rural, urban and regional city locations by maximising the investment in regional infrastructure such that in co-working facilities to, re to retain mobile talent in regions and to make second sites in regional locations a feasible strategy for the agency's clients engaged in growth plans. We will also seek to secure food FDI projects in regions and to address the skills challenges facing clients which I have already mentioned. Enterprise Ireland is aware that further efforts are needed to ensure that companies are resilient to the challenges they face as they start and scale in regions throughout the country. The agency understands the important positive and social impact these companies play in their local areas. To this end, the agency will continue to work with client companies to support their efforts on innovation, competitiveness and diversification, the key attributes of internationally competitive companies. Second sites, skills and co-working spaces in regions that build on the agency investment will also be a key focus. Enterprise Ireland will continue to work with government and non-government stakeholders to support rural, urban and regional city development so that client companies can build on their ambitious strategies to sustain and, and create jobs throughout the country. I would welcome any questions on these activities and would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Christel. Um, I now call on Ms uh, Orla Martin from the Offaly County Council. Leo, please. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the Chair and members of the Committee for the invitation to attend and to discuss how we sustain small rural and community businesses through smart communities and remote working. I am joined by uh, Ms Anna-Marie Delaney, Chief Executive of Offaly County Council, and my colleague Geraldine Byrne, Business Advisor with the Local Enterprise Office in Offaly. For the purposes of this statement, I would like to look at four areas. The Local Enterprise Office involvement, the Local Authority contribution, the wider context and future development and policy and suggestions. So the local enterprise offices. There are 31 local enterprise offices across the local authority network. The local enterprise office is the first stop shop for anyone looking to set up or start a business in Ireland. Furthermore, the local enterprise office promotes entrepreneurship and is an advocate and um, catalyst for the establishment of a best practice enterprise culture. Across the, the network of 31 LEO offices, staff are actively involved in supporting co-working hubs, some directly through local authority hubs and others through their involvement with publicly funded DACs or CLGs. The primary focus of the LEO office is to encourage entrepreneurship and start-ups. Therefore, managed co-working hubs play a, an important contribution to the ecosystem of enterprise supports. They provide much more than a physical space for startups and growing businesses. The interaction between the early stage entrepreneurs, remote workers, more experienced business owners and the LEO staff and supports contribute strongly to the enterprise culture of a town or village. Tenants may or may not be directly supported depending on the nature of their business but a wide cohort are supported by LEO entrepreneurial training programmes, networking and other business supports. 
I'd like to talk a little bit about sector specific hubs. So managed co-working hubs with sectoral themes provide new opportunities to develop clusters of expertise and innovation. Sector specific hubs include food hubs and those with a defined theme. So for an example, in Offaly, we established the Junction Business Innovation Centre in 2015 with a special focus on design, software and re renewable energies. We're now building on this and through funding of nearly €500,000 from the Enterprise Ireland Regional Development Fund, we're about to develop Stream Creative Suite in Burr. And this new co-working hub will leverage the big data generated by the new iLofer radio telescope and will connect researchers and businesses in areas using big data. We're using the theme STREAM, because STREAM and STREAM is an acronym for science, technology, research, engineering, arts and maths. So those businesses include everything from animation to astronomy, robotics, telecoms and software. A dedicated hub like this can create a very compelling proposition for IDA to attract related FDI or foreign direct investment to the area. And furthermore, sector specific hubs can be a beacon for diaspora looking to return or invest in their home county. The local authority contribution. The Local Government Reform Act 2014 provided for strengthening of the role of the local authorities towards economic, social and community development. Over the past number of years, local authorities have been contributing to the delivery of the physical infrastructure of co-working hubs and in many cases have been providing support towards operational costs. Some have been undertaken directly by local authorities and others have been delivered with support funding through LEADER, Town and Village Renewal Schemes, the um, Urban and Rural Regeneration, Enterprise Ireland Regional Development Funds, etc. And furthermore, local authorities have been providing supports towards the development of smart communities via the local authority network of broadband officers, prioritising needs via a network of 296 broadband communication <coughs> points throughout Ireland and collaborating with providers and funders to de deliver fibre and Wi-Fi solutions for businesses, communities and tourist areas. Library services providing meeting rooms and spaces for informal hot desking and for pre-startups researching business ideas. Local Community and Development Committee, the LCDCs, through that role were assisting community groups incorporate co-working spaces into community centres. Skills audits and commuter surveys. Local authorities, in conjunction with LEO and business support units, are commissioning research data to stimulate economic investment. This data will also highlight the, um, the opportunities for remote working and cluster development. <coughs> Excuse me. In a wider context, remote working in all its forms can be very beneficial for individuals, businesses, communities and the environment. Volunteer groups such as Grow Remote are playing an important role in communicating the benefits of remote working. Individuals can benefit from a reduced commute and increased work-life balance. In, um, by introducing remote working, businesses can both retain staff and grow staff numbers through accessing a wider talent pool. And communities will benefit as the busy co-working hubs contribute to vibrant towns and villages. And this in turn leads to increased spend in the locality. The environment benefits from a reduction in carbon emissions and a reduction of commuters benefits Dublin and it allows it thrive as an international business and visitor destination. The inclusion of remote working and co-working hubs as strategic objectives or support actions in a number of the regional enterprise plans demonstrates the importance of this concept and commitment to further development. Looking then at just some future development and policy suggestions, with regard to the co-working hubs, the managed co-working hubs, leveraging the opportunities of co-working hubs requires skilled managers. Currently, the funding supports for managers are for a three years salary. And we suggest five years funding support would be more appropriate so as to allow the centres the required timescale to become viable and self-sustaining. 
enhanced connectivity between hubs. This is the next stage or the next phase. Explore ways to support a formal network of co-working hubs so as to leverage economies of scale in research, collaboration, training and funding opportunities. Include landing spaces for FTI, for foreign direct investment. Explore ways to facilitate IDA companies establish an initial footprint in a town or region via the use of co-working hubs. The promotion of co-working hubs and other forms of remote working would benefit or could benefit from the following. Legislation, develop, <coughs> develop a national policy on remote working. This could include appropriate legislation around employment law and enable remote working to become the norm. And we reference the UK Flexible Working Regulations 2014. <clears throat> Excuse me. Incentivise employers. Consider an enhanced revenue scheme or allowance for remote workers. Then, finally, public sector pilots. Explore opportunities for public sector employees. This could include enhanced opportunities to, for remote working, either from home or from, for use from dedicated co-working hubs within local authority buildings on a reciprocal basis. Thank you very much for your time. Your document pack includes details of some initiatives taking place around the country. Thanks very much, Ms Martin. Um, I now call on Ms Vanessa Tierney of a board, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name, thank you Chair, my name is Vanessa Tierney of Abodu and I'm here with Louise O'Connor. Um, I'm delighted to be invited in here today and I'd, I'd like to thank the Chair and members of the committee for the invitation in order to discuss sustaining small rural and community business, smart communities and remote working. Um, very quickly, our personal story, um, we launched Abodu in Gorey, North Wexford. We were a Leo client, we've moved on to Enterprise Ireland now. And we actually launched um, a year and a quarter ago from a co-working space. And so we have a very personal story about the impact of co-working to our business. And also speaking from my own experience, I've been in recruitment and talent acquisition for over 15 years. Um, and seven, eight years ago, I, through illness, was restricted from working um, and I couldn't commute. And it's when I started to realise that there were a lot of professionals across the globe that could be working, but for whatever reason, if it's family commitments or childcare, that would be restricting them. And so the reason that we are here today is to talk about a successful pilot that we ran in Wexford with the support of Wexford Leo, Wexford County Council, um, where there was a real opportunity to identify the skills of County Wexford and present that to companies that were considering locations around the country. Um, if we look right now at, at Ireland, yes, our unemployment rate is extremely low, which is brilliant, but we do still have 79 black spots of unemployment around the country. And mirroring that with co-working capacity, there's a real opportunity to position rural Ireland as an opportunity for companies. So we believe that there are three key pillars for inward investment into rural Ireland. The first being the office space, the capacity. Um, on the Abodu platform, we're now listing over 200 co-working spaces, so there are at least one in every um, county in Ireland. Secondly is connectivity, and uh, we are improving. And uh, like from my perspective, from a remote working perspective, there are no challenges to working in rural Ireland right now. Every single county has connectivity. Every single co-working space has the best connectivity. Um, and a uh, personal story again, I moved back from England four years ago to three meg in the house. We now have 140 meg, so there's a real opportunity for companies. But the missing ingredient to the three key pillars that is required by Enterprise Ireland and the IDA is the skills and the talent. So we have to question why do Facebook or Salesforce make announcements to employ people in Dublin when we have ample employee. We have 700,000 people across the country that could be employed that are skilled. And so what is missing is to be able to provide, provide the data. So up until our pilot, the information that was provided uh, on skills available was the census and alumni information from different colleges. Um, however, be, the way we've uh, built Abodu, we capture a lot of data as to what people are looking for in terms of skills, salary expectations, connecti connectivity. And Wexford requested us to be able to produce a talent heat map of the available skills initially just on tech to present to some companies that were looking at the co-working space in Gorey. We ran this pilot over six weeks. We ran marketing campaigns above and below the line. We had adverts on the back of buses, a mother and son spend more time with the real bus. We had signs saying the train will miss you. And over the space of literally a few weeks, we had hundreds and hundreds of people registering. 
Now, we assumed it was going to be the tired, exhausted commuters from Wexford to Dublin, but it actually was a range. It was a range of people that were outside of the country that wanted to come home. That said, they weren't coming home because when they looked at Dublin house prices, it was too expensive, but if they could go to Wexford, they would be back in a flash. We had people with mobility issues that just can't get to Dublin, really skilled parents in their mid to late 30s that just couldn't justify going to Dublin because when you add in childcare, um, and an array of people registering and some older people that weren't ready to retire. So we captured all of this, we data mined it, and we produced a talent heat map, which essentially gives granular information, not only on the skills within tech, but exactly how many Python developers, how many Java developers, but the two surprising facts that came out of the talent heat map, one, salary expectations were 10 to 20% lower than the cities. And I bring that up as a really big point for employers because many of them think they have to invest in a big way to embrace smart working. But the saving alone on expectations, because house prices are a third or a half, the other element that was a surprise to us were only half the people were actually in County Wexford. The other half were in Dublin or they were outside of the country saying that they wanted to move back. So we ran this case study this time last year, provided it to LEO, Enterprise Ireland, the Council and IDA. And in September of last year, the IDA successfully landed the first company into the Hatch Lab that intends to go on to employ hundreds of people in the next three years. But the interesting fact is that they want to embrace what we like to use the term smart working. I'm going to say something bold here. I don't know whether Ireland is ready for remote working because people make the assumption that it's working from home. I think we're ready for smart working. I think you know, we're ready for more flexibility in our working model. And therefore, companies like the one that has landed in Gorey intend to let people work two, three days in the co-working capacity and then the other days at home. What that means is, even though the building there only has seating for 300, they could employ 500 because of this hot desking situation. Um, so right now, we have worked and collaborated with LEOs, County Councils, IDA, Enterprise Ireland, and we're currently doing a national roadshow with the Small Firms Association to educate people on a local level. And we are partnered with Grow Remote because they're doing a great job on a community level. We have a national partnership with Vodafone, educating people around smart working and educating businesses to the benefits and value. And we will be looking to support them in opening up more gigahubs around the country. Um, on the gigahubs alone, in the last two, three years, the 29 new companies have established from these gigahubs and it's created 80 jobs, expected to be 200 in the next few years. But what are the overall benefits for smart working um, from a company's perspective? Well, People that sit in traffic all day, and as a small country we now have 1.9 million people commuting every day for work, that are quite tired by the time they get to the office, especially if you throw children in the mix. Um, attrition improves by 40%. Globally this has been proven when you embrace flexible working. Uh, productivity goes up by 15%. And the overall savings to the company on average is 10,000 and to the individual is 7,000 euros a year. And that 7,000 euros a year that they can save, where will they spend it if they're staying in their local community? So where are we now with Abodu and our missions with Leos and so on? Well, Leos have kindly invited us to, in April to present to all 31, which we're really looking forward to, to doing on what we've done for Wexford and seeing if we can extend it. We're building technology to not just pull talent to heat maps, but in the future connect people on a local level. So we can do things like connect them in co-working spaces with similar skills to tie in what was said for Offaly. Um, we're launching smart working retreats, a lovely way to build on tourism, leveraging these amazing co-working spaces that are coming up around the country, converted banks and so on, and let people holiday here and work here for a month. Um, we are plugging in e-learning because the beauty about smart working and working from home, connectivity or co-working, you can learn from anywhere and upskill and that will be the future. So the key benefits to Ireland if we can really work out a national plan for remote or smart working. Well, a passion for me, improve air quality, the carbon emissions, uh, the tax that's coming. <laughs> we could do an amazing job in terms of reducing the emissions. The local economy spend will go up. We could reduce unemployment across the black spots and really give people t family time back. Um, over the next few years, we would ask of the government the following. The first is any introductions that would help us um, fast track the conversations that we're having county to county. The second is to look for the support around a national talent mapping skills. Uh, what we've done in Wexford, but 
let's extend it to the whole country because that sort of data we could provide companies in Dublin, Cork and even companies that are working with the IDA about landing here in Ireland. Um, and finally, support from the Disruptive Te Technology Fund um, in order to be able to mobilise the app that we're using that's currently on web and localise it so that it's key to each county, Wexford, Carlow and so on. Um, with 42% of the population living in rural Ireland versus 27% across Europe, we have a real opportunity to become the smart working leader of the entire European Union, I believe. Um, and we can reverse the brain drain. And in fact, we can bring some of the half a million people that have left our country uh, in the last 10 years back. And finally, I end uh, with referencing the fact that we've provided the Wexford Talent Heat Map, and we have copies here today um, with the pack. And I'll end with our motto, life is a journey, not a commute. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, um, Vanessa. Um, I now call on Ken Tobin of HQ uh, Trilly and Trilly Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Gerlach. Um Thank you for the opportunity of speaking today. In 2016, with my business partner Tom O'Leary, we set about funding and developing the first co-working hub in County Kerry and one of the first in the country. Um, and as speakers have said today, there's now over 200 of these hubs around the country. Our hub was privately funded and is privately operated. Um, initially, in 2016, we opened with one building in Tree Town Centre, which was a vacant property, a property that sat idle for over nine years. Um, the following year, we opened a second building within Tree, and in 2018, in October, we opened the third building, this time in Listol, which is a small town uh, about 10, 11 miles away from Tree. Today, our hubs provide a home for almost 200 people that are working in Tree and Listol. We recognise the essential need within these towns, like many other towns around Ireland. In total, we've provided an excess of 15,000 square feet of shared offices, co-working, meeting rooms, community space, at a fraction of the cost of that of a hub in a larger city. All our hubs offer one gig broadband, that's 1,000 megabyte broadband connectivity, using a combination of a local internet service provider, and our Tree Hub is one of the Vodafone, Syro, Gigabit Hub initiative hubs. Um, we house a huge range of individuals and companies within our, our hubs, the details of which are in my submission. Um, I want to highlight a couple of key factors that we've learned through our involvement in the industry, um, being one of the first to do this in Ireland. Um, you would have heard from previous speakers, not only today but also in recent sittings of this committee, that remote working, enabled broadband connective, connectivity and supporting hubs are critical to reviving and sustaining rural and regional towns. My submission today is not about reiterating things that you've already heard, um, but demonstrating what has actually happened. One of the key things we've learned over the past few years is the importance of these hubs is not solely on the service it provides for the companies and remote workers, but in fact the economic and social benefit to the towns that they're based in. In the past three years, we've seen everyday examples of how a hub and supporting people to return to a town can actually benefit the local economy. And this is not just on a financial level, but it is worth noting that our hubs have an average salary of twice that of the local economy around us, which means twice the spend per person in the local town. On a human level, we've seen business owners and newly returned remote workers getting involved in supporting local tidy towns groups, chambers of commerce, sports clubs, charities and volunteer organisations. The benefit of one of the main benefits of working from a regional town with low commute times and a better quality of life means that these people have more time to get involved in organisations and causes that matter to them. As these individuals typically have been used to a city commute and a longer working week, they have more time on their hands. And it isn't just the town that the hub is based in that benefits. Returning remote workers and SME business owners are opting to live in quieter villages and townlands near but not in the main town itself. Typically, the people we see returning are at the age that they are considering or have recently started a new family. And to a, to a degree, the companies and remote workers we've supporting, supported in returning to Tralee and Listowel have returned back because they had a connection with that location and because we had a hub, they were enabled to return. We have found it tough to attract back the younger graduates and um, the younger generation in the mid-twenties. On a business level, there's two critical elements to providing this opportunity for regional and rural towns. The hubs actually support the growth not only of the businesses based within the hubs, but also the businesses within that town. And this isn't anecdotal, this is actually real. We see this every day ourselves. The businesses that we support are wide and varied. Um, but being conscious of time constraints, I want to focus in on a couple of key items. Staff retention. Ask any employer of an SME in Dublin or Cork, in specific 
in the technical sector. Staff retention is one of the key things that is killing their business at the moment. This issue of not being able to hang on to good staff is being compounded by a number of key factors that this government has an element of control over. Quality staff are being hoovered up by the large multinationals and invariably they are being lured away from our indigenous companies at an alarming rate. And while we all welcome the announcements of the next Facebook, Google or Salesforce entering the Dublin market, behind that there is a real concern that smaller companies will not be able to retain their skilled staff. Each big announcement also adds more pressure onto an already overheated housing market in our larger cities, forcing even more people to seek housing further and further out of the city, adding hours onto their daily commute. What the hubs and regional locations offer to these companies is an opportunity. And I can't stress this enough, we are selling ourselves very short if we pitch these regional locations as a compromise. In fact, these regional locations are a godsend to many SMEs. To give an example, we had one company join us a little over a year ago, primarily because the larger companies in Dublin were poaching their staff. Since coming down, this two-man operation has quickly grown to seven people, and by the end of 2019 will have grown to 20 people, purely because they are able to retain their staff based in a regional town. To support, <clears throat> to support staff retention and to echo previous speakers, these hubs present a major opportunity for large organisations in Dublin to retain their staff by allowing them to remote work and have a better quality of life. We have seen this ourselves, but larger companies need to be put under pressure to allow their staff to have this choice. As would have been mentioned earlier, all bar one of our existing remote workers pay for themselves. Their companies will not support them. While they say they will support them, they will not financially support them to re relocate to a regional location. Um, the second set of businesses that benefit from the hubs are actually those based in the hubs, not based in the hubs themselves. Those businesses are the local ones around the town, the shops, restaurants and pubs. When we opened our first hub in 2016, we knew that the street around our hub needed some support. Our first building in Tree was a large vacant property. While a fantastic modern building, it laid idle for over nine years and faced out onto a semi-derelict side street. So we developed a plan to promote the neighbouring neighbor shops, bars and restaurants and help them raise their footfall. We formed a community of businesses that worked together, which led us to take on privately funded regeneration projects for the street around us in Tralee. So much so, two new businesses opened up in that vacant street. Listowel, where we opened our, our latest hub, didn't need our support. You know, they're National Tidy Towns Award winners from 2018. Where they needed our support was inf on infrastructure. Um, I think we put too much emphasis over the national broadband layout, rollout. Um, in the case of Listowel, we didn't have access to high-speed fi high, high fibre. We were faced with a choice of operating off of a 70 meg broadband or do it ourselves. So. We engaged with a local internet service provider and we did it ourselves. We invested into that company. We supported that company to provide one gig broadband to our building in the stall, which is now actually available to the entire town. I mentioned earlier where we struggle is attracting the younger generation to our hubs. Through my work with Tralee Chamber Alliance, Tralee Chamber of Commerce and connecting with chambers all over the country, I know that Tralee and the stall are not unlike many towns in regional Ireland. There has been a drain of talent and younger people over the past number of years, and a very visible cause and effect of this drain is the daytime vibrancy and the nightlife in these towns. We know our high streets are struggling, rural bars and nightclubs are in free fall, and our institutes of technology are fighting with the larger universities to attra attract students. And as the cities grow and expand, the younger generation are being lured and retained there. Kerry, for example, now has the oldest, oldest average age in the country, and the statistics show that we have a huge dip in the mid-20s age, mid age bracket. Just like after the collapse of the Celtic Tiger, when so many of our young people left Ireland, everyone cried foul for a lost generation. Today the same thing is happening, only that they are immigrating from rural to city location. When I started my submission, um, I said I wouldn't focus on items that other people have, have looked at already. So I want to finish with what we in business call the ask. Um, and this is about connecting the dots and trying to see can we do this um, in an accelerated, meaningful way. We've already mentioned that there's over 200 hubs around the country. More will be built, but what we need to do is increase the demand for companies and remote workers to go to these regional locations. And based on our experience, we see two very quick win items that can be done now. Firstly, we see an immediate need for a government-backed team supported by Enterprise Ireland, the LEOs and the local chambers of commerce, whose sole remit is to connect the SMEs in Dublin and Cork with the regional town hubs and remote work organisations. 
Utilising the industry connections of Enterprise Ireland and the underground connections of the local chambers, this team should have the sole function of providing a funnel of people and companies and remote workers who want to escape the larger cities to set up in regional locations. This team, and I think was mentioned earlier, should have the backing of a dedicated incentive programme to support these companies and remote workers in their relocation. There are numerous examples in the States and the continent of successful incentive programs where relocation assistance packages are provided to enable remote workers and SMEs to move to regional locations. And these are done for a fraction of the cost currently being spent on other avenues to create jobs. Not only would this have the benefit of supporting these regional towns, but it would take the pressure off the larger cities. Secondly, and finally, um, we need support in our regional towns to attract back and retain younger generation and families. Without adequate funding to enhance the offering on the ground, younger, younger workers will not consider these regional towns. Specific investment must be put into towns in order to increase their vibrancy and support the retail and service industries so that younger workers don't feel that they are compromising on the experience. Locations must become more vibrant, and I would suggest utilising the framework for town centre renewal document. Uh, and my, my ask would be to legislate further to the establishment of funded teams to support these regional towns. I thank you for the opportunity, Carol. Thanks very much, Mr. Tobin. Um, I know I'm going to call on uh, members uh, as they've indicated, and um, Senator Polly Coffey, I'm going to bring you in, um, Deputy Martin Kenny and Deputy Michael Collins. And that's the first round, and then I'll take another round after that. So, yeah, uh, Senator Coffey? Yeah, Gormago, Cahillac. And first of all, I want to welcome all of the delegations that, are, that um, have, have come here this morning to, to share their experiences and, I suppose, to offer advice to us as policymakers, um, who, I suppose, on this committee, are of particular concern is regional Ireland and rural Ireland and how we can sustain uh, livelihoods in, in, in those regions. Um, I just want to put on the record, too, um, my acknowledgement for the work of Enterprise Ireland over the last number of years, where we now see that there's over 2.23 million people working in Ireland at the moment. Uh, that's the recorded figures for 2018, which is the highest ever. And, you know, I, I'm very conscious of the work of the, the city and county Leos as well, uh, supporting entrepreneurs, supporting new businesses, many of them who, who you know, started in the face of, of a, a very harsh recession. And I think, you know, it was uh, an amazing bounce back by amazing people supported by the state agencies and the LEOs, and I think we should always acknowledge that uh, when, when we can. And I certainly want to do so here, here this morning. But there are new challenges now. Um, you know, with, with the employment levels um, where they are, I think you know, quality of life, smarter working, sustainability, these are the challenges now for Ireland. And I think we have a role, Chairman, uh, in this committee to try and devise new policies to address the very uh, issues that, that the delegations have raised here this morning. And I, I said it to some of them on the way in, often they're way ahead of the posse in terms of uh, we're often in a bubble here in Leinster House dealing with um, retrospective issues, which, which we have to do, uh, but often the real uh, vision comes from outside, and we're hearing it here today again, and I want to acknowledge that, especially with the likes of Abadou. We've had Grow Remote in here as well. People that have a vision for how our society should develop and where our employment should go. And I think it can fit, certainly can fit, with the needs of modern families and, and work life patterns. Um, I was very interested to hear about the, um, the, the talent heat maps that have been carried out in Wexford. And I think before we do anything in terms of policy, of course, you need to have evidence of where where our assets are, where our resources are, and how we should best leverage those. And I think, uh, you know, often the easy answers are right in front of our noses. And here we are uh, in Wexford, uh, have shown the way in terms of mapping out the talent that's available to them if a business wants to establish itself, either in Wexford or in smarter hubs or whatever. And I think it's a good starting point for anyone. And I, I take on board your recommendation that. Um, we should have a national talent map, and I think we should, Chairman. Recently, I, I was in discussions with a company that are looking at establishing in the South East in the financial services area, and we met with IDA representatives, and the first thing they said was, we'll have to do a skills analysis for the South East. And I had a bit of an argument with them because I said most of our graduates, unfortunately, have left the South East, they're either in Dublin or elsewhere. And I said that skills analysis is not, shouldn't just be in the South East, it should be all over the world, in fact, because people want to move home. I was delighted to hear, hear uh, Vanessa actually repeat it here again this morning. Um, so there's a mindset in officialdom, in our, and, and I, you know, I do acknowledge the great work IDA are doing, but they more or less box off regions. 
and they look at regions what, where the talent in that region is presently, whereas I believe they must have a far more outward looking view. And yes, most people, and I'm only using the South East because I'm from the South East, I'm from Waterford, uh, and it is one of the unemployment black spots in the country. It is one of the areas where we've suffered most brain drain. Uh, where our graduates unfortunately qualify in Waterford but unfortunately leave the region and that happens right around the country and um, I've often compared Dublin to the economic vortex that's sucking in our, our best resources. So we need to think of new ways to try and um, get those brains and get those graduates and get those life as, as Ken has said back into the regions and uh, I, I certainly welcome the very positive outlook that has been presented to us here this morning and it's not just an outlook there's actually real solutions being presented here. Um, I visited Boxworks, uh, you might know those, are a, they're a, a co-working location in Waterford um, where they have created a smart hub where a small um, hot desks or small offices are provided to any person or entity or body that wants to come in and do work and they're sharing ideas, sharing resources and they're building out and the good news, the good news Cahirlik, is the second box work office is opening in a few weeks in Waterford uh, and, and it's doing exactly what, what you're talking about. So I believe the entrepreneurs and the people are ahead of the policy makers and uh, the evidence is out there so we need to catch up and how we do that is I, I believe is the discussion we need to have here today. Um, do we need to change the view in terms of how it's, uh, it's coordinated overall? You know, I, like whilst I did acknowledge at the outset Enterprise Ireland, should we have a specific department in Enterprise Ireland that are looking at connecting these hubs, looking at new ways of actually supporting entrepreneurs? I know you're doing it and you'll tell us you're doing it, but I think we need specific resources now to, at to, at to attend to the new demands that are out there. Smarter living, smarter travel, smarter work cooperation, uh, adjoining resources. So the examples are out there. You've mentioned that there's 200 hubs around Ireland. I've mentioned two in Waterford. I just think we need to coordinate all of that now and get policy support and get incentives in around there. Um, my questions are, like, how do we do that better? From a, if Put yourselves in our shoes as policy makers. Where do you feel the, the real changes are needed now to, to get that gear shift that's required. So rather than looking at traditional ways of supporting employment, you know, how do we engage the employers, for example, to build confidence? I think that's one way we really need to um, build confidence in employers that this is actually a new way of working, that you, know, you, need, you can trust your staff once you maybe do it on a step process. I think you mentioned it as well, where you go into a co-working location first, maybe part-time, and then maybe the rest from home. So I think there's a job of work to be done in how we can build confidence with employers to show them that they needn't be spending fortunes of work building offices in Dublin with their staff, you know, worked and crazed then with the cost of living, cost of rent, that they can actually do this a different way. And I'm just wondering how best we can do that. How can we capture that into a parcel and start selling it to employers? That's my question. So thank Thanks you very, very much, much um, You might bank that question, whoever wants to take it. I now take um, Deputy Martin Kenny, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. And I want to welcome you all here this morning. And uh, thank you for your contributions. Uh, we had, as, as has been said, um, last week people in from Grow Remote to talk about what, what they've done and the, and the work that they're doing around similar, similar lines. Um, as somebody who represents a constituency in North West, Sligo Leitrim, and I live in South Leitrim, which is quite rural, it's probably one of those black spots that you mentioned uh, in regard to employment. And interestingly, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were looking at a, a job online from, I think it was eBay, and uh, they were interested in applying for it, but it had to be at home because it was going to be some of it in the evening, some of it early mornings. No internet, not a chance. And that's a big problem in, in, for people who live in rural Ireland in, in, in areas where there, where there is, and I accept that the connection and the, the, the high-speed broadband is available in many of our towns, regional towns, etc. But when you go out to the country a little bit, you have that problem. And that's something that, that I think we, we need to address. Um, however, there is huge potential here. And... Um, I think that the suggestions that have been made and, and the suggestion that there needs to be a government-backed team that, uh, that Ken mentioned in regard to how to, to, to drive this or to, to pull it all together is almost um, a sense, is, is, is Grow Remote doing a bit of that? Are other, are other if you like, um, small groups out there doing parts of what you're talking about? And what, what you're really saying is that we need to step back from it and do it in a proper organised fashion where, where, if you like, government needs to step in, and, and, and uh, which I would agree would be the way forward with it because what can happen is it can become bitty rather than being 
streamlined and, 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 and across the whole, the whole region. The other issue that, that also was mentioned by Ken in regard to um, our regional towns and, and, and getting them a more attractive pay, pay place for people to come and live and work, and a lot of that is around um, having the correct infrastructure in place. I remember it's a good few years ago, it was, I think it was actually Peter Quinn consultants in Fermanagh had done a study on foreign direct investment and where people wanted to to send their, their executives to live and to work. And they found that education was a big thing, that there was good schools in the area, that if they were going to have the, the managers of their new business that they wanted to know that there was very good schools, that there were good recreation facilities, that hospitals and, 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 and health care was adequately provided for. And that those things, and that's one of, one of the main reasons why they also like to have nice restaurants and good theatres to go to. <laughs> that, that was part of it as well. Uh, and, and of course, the, having connectivity that they could get, that they could be close to airports, that they could be close to, that they could fly in, have their meetings in their offices, and be back on the plane in a way quickly. That, that, that was part of it. So those infrastructure elements are, are key to all of this as well. But I, I don't think we should lose. Uh, the reality that it's not just about good roads and good transport, it's also about having the services in place for people who want to come and live in those areas. Um, and that's going to be key for getting people to come back to, to, to live in, in, in more parts of rural Ireland. Uh, the other issues that were mentioned in regard to the, I'll just I do this on the computer rather than on the, uh, uh, the, the issue that was mentioned in regard to the other stuff from the other asks in regard to what you felt uh, would be needed for remote work and legislation to develop a national policy on remote work, um, that it becomes the norm. And, and you mentioned the, the flexible working regulations. I think there's already um, legislation here for people to have the option of part-time work, that an employer has to accept that as something that a person can require and can request. And I think we need to, we need to look at that as well in regard to remote working. That's something that people would, would be able to look at. Um, the incentive for employers and, and, and revenue schemes and allowances for remote workers and that, that, uh, that the, pub, the private sector is, of course, the direction that a lot of people are talking about because a lot of this stuff is thing that you, you sit in front of your laptop when you do, but also the public sector. And while we've had you know, lots, lots of rows about decentralisation in the past, I, I think really it's about getting it right and working out how we can do that properly. And I know people who work in the public sector and work two days at home and three days in the office and, and do that already. So there is an element of that happening, but I think it's down to really the, the, the key thing here is the issue that Ken raised about making sure that we streamline it, that government takes a, an action here and takes charge of this and actually organises it and structures it and, and drives it forward. And the other issues that I, I think is, is important to raise as well, for people who live and work at home, uh, one of the problems is it may suit their lives very well when, for instance, they have children and they have all that, but as they get on a little bit and the next thing is that the empty nest and they're at home and they get up in the morning and they sit in front of a laptop all day and then they go to bed at night, it's not a great social environment to live in. And that's something I think that the hubs will, would, would be a better model for a lot of people. The other issue is, and it comes into it as well, is in regard to employee rights, the rights of the employee that if they're working in, a, in the, whether it's people who, for instance, everyone who works in this establishment is clearly a member of a trade union and have rights and, have, and, and those rights can be established and can be worked through and they can, they can do something about it if there's a problem somewhere. Whereas if they're working at home or they're working in a hub and there's only two people working for the company that they work for in that hub, you know, there needs to be some way of ensuring the, the, the rights of the employee are somehow going to be upheld, and I think there's, there's probably an element of that that we could, we could look at, maybe speaking to the, the Congress of Trade Unions or something about as to what way they're organising around that, but that's a separate issue. I think the, um, the real drive behind all of this needs to be to get it coordinated. That's really what we need to do. And secondly, I would be very strong that we need to ensure that the, the, the level of, of commitment needed from government for to provide the correct infrastructure in place has to be put there. And a big part of that infrastructure is the broadband, but it's other stuff as well. And when you talk about rural Ireland, people talk about, you know, about equality, that it's about equality. But the difference between equality and equity was explained to me once, and I thought it was very well explained. And that's how we need to do it in rural Ireland. We need to look at it from a point of view of equity. If you have two people that want to look over a wall, and the wall is too high for both of them to look over, and you go to the first person and you give them a box to stand on, 
and they can now see over the wall. You go to the 6X person, you give them the same size of a box to stand on. But they're a little bit shorter and they still can't see over it. You've treated both of them equally, but it hasn't established equity because neither one of them can see over the wall and the other one can't. So if from a rural Ireland perspective, I think we need to see not just equal resources going into it, we need to see extra resources going into it to establish equity and because it has long been left behind. And certainly in the areas that I come from, we often talk about this in the, in the context of the boom. You know, it was the last place for to see the boom and it was the first place for to see the decline. And that's, that's what always happens. So I, I think we need to try and reverse that, and, and I certainly welcome this effort to try and reverse that. But those are the key points I think that we, we need to deal with. We need to deal with making sure that we have the, 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 the level of commitment to it, and that, that means that some element of government needs to take charge of it, that we need to take charge of the infrastructure, and that we need to look at the rights of the workers when they are there and when we get them established. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thanks, Deputy Kenny. Um, Deputy Michael Collins. Thank you, uh, Chairman. No, I just, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, all those who've made presentations uh, here today and uh, our last meeting as well. Um, some very interesting presentations. Um, a lot of it is based, obviously, about connectivity. And um, if you don't have connectivity, it's very difficult to to run any type of business, and with broadband in particular, even mobile phone coverage, and it's a huge issue down in my own constituency in Cork South West. And a lot is to do with getting funds from the government, just getting yourself off the ground, basically, and, and, and um, making a start as such. And if you get that type of support, if they can get the broadband right, and, and they can get the funding right, you're, you're starting to go places. And I see that in, in Skibreen uh, with Ludgate. It, it's getting the funding, and it's, get, it's getting its feet on the ground, and it's getting places. But then there's a vacuum in surrounds in my own constituency, and I can only talk on behalf of my own constituency. And I saw the Rural Regeneration and Development Fund was released last week. And there is no more a rural place than Cork South West. Anybody that has been down there, it's beautiful in the summer and all that, but it has its rural uh, issues to uh, fight through. There was 48 uh, uh, projects put forward by the Cork County Council, we got zero. Zero. Okay. So, yeah, rightly so. I'm, I'm very angered. I met the community group, some of them during the weekend. They're incensed because they ticked all the boxes. And I've looked at those who did get money. And some of them are great projects. And I would never take away from any one of them. But just a couple of them I picked there. One, Quilta got 10 million euros. Now, Quilta have their own funds. The Department of Arts, Culture, Heritage, they got three and a half million. They have their own funds. So, like, why are we dipping in now out of the Rural Regeneration Development Fund and funding these departments? Is it the children's hospital shortfall is the problem? Is this a backdoor scheme and to top it up some other way? But the problem is the 48 projects, most of them in, in my own constituency, some in the rest of the uh, Cork County that were put forward by the council, got zero. And I could name out some of them there. Incredibly, incredibly, no, no, Chairman. Just, 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 just listen. I, I, I take the point you're making, yeah. and this is the rural community development committee. I know, but, but is the minister. Yes, and you, you've raised it, but the witnesses aren't in the position to, I know that, to come back to in relation to that. You I, know, and I respect you've made that charges and I in relation to, you know, we. Yeah, like, and I want the minister back here. Well, and, and we'll do that another day. We'll do, yeah, and but absolutely open it. But let's be fair to the witnesses here. Yes, many of those projects, Chairman were very similar to the projects that got off the ground here, sure. got their funding, are, are still continuing to get their funding. We, in a rural community, if we do not get that type of funding, we can't get our feet off the ground as such. And I mean, I'd love to be able to sit down there and bring in a group, and Ludgate can now in fairness, I will accept that in Skibbereen, they can do that, but Skibbereen is just not, li not able to live on its own. The West Cork needs uh, that energy. We haven't got the broadband, unfortunately. It hasn't rolled out. Um, Everybody knows that's, not, that's a national issue, it's not a West Cork issue. And it's very hard for us to equal any of the, uh, the great opportunities that you've got, and you've got them and worked on them. And I praise you uh, for my, I never take anything away from a community that's worked, or an area that's worked, but uh, it is a very important point, and I would think that this committee needs to bring the minister before us to explain first how is the money uh, being spent, and why isn't it being spent in, in com rural communities that want to get, get their feet in ground and want to be equally as, as likely going forward? And I wish you the best going forward. I'm not taking away from anything you've done, but I think it's a very valid point that I have to make. To make. And I will continue to do that, because this uh, Rural Development Fund was only announced last Friday. 62 million, zero to West Cork, and I need answers.
Uh, Deputy, uh, the Minister was coming in in early April. Um, I'm sure he'll, he'll answer those questions. Uh, he'll be asked anyway by you, and I'm sure he'll answer them. Um, so I, I'd like um, to, uh, Senator Kenny or Senator Coffey um, made a number of points there and questions, as did um, 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 Deputy Kenny. So maybe your witnesses might want to take uh, a few of them there, Vanessa. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Senator. Um, the, the question around how, how do we do it, um, because it's multifaceted, as you've highlighted, and there are so many great groups on the ground, county to county, doing work. Um, from a, if we look at the, the connectivity perspective, I'm not a connectivity company, but I believe, and I, I can see a lot of them are doing great efforts to connect, maybe not all the homes, but certainly the co-working spaces. So I think what's needed is a, a national framework for co-working, where, you know, We've highlighted today that employees are paying, in most cases, for their own subscription or membership and co-working. But WeWork, which is a global phenomenal of a co-working company, um, have announced last year that 35% of their members are now employees of enterprise accounts. So they're attracting the Facebooks and Microsofts, but they can do that because once you take a subscription with WeWork, you've got global access. So we would propose that we could do the same uh, with Abodu because we have all 200 on our platform. We would need to advance the technology in order for the subscriptions. And I think that conversation can be taken to the large enterprise companies and the foreign direct investment. The second is the national, or the national talent heat map. We are ready to go. We just need the green light and some funding. We did it quite economically for Wexford, and we leveraged all the local PR and marketing channels that they had through the council. So it was affordable. Uh, we got buy-in. You'll have read a lot of K um, commuter studies have been done. I've talked to about five or six Leos about their commuter studies. They were great to create the momentum, but they didn't give the detailed granular skills data that we need for the finance company saying, have you got finance people on the southeast? And I would see the, the beauty of Ireland Inc. doing a national talent mapping would be that we'd be able to demonstrate the peak or the clusters of skills for finance, for example. So they could be Waterford, they could be West Cork when they have connectivity, they could be Offaly. And then companies could make decisions as to how they would land in there. Um, but that is ready to go. There is no policy needed, it's just backing. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, uh, Mr. Christel. Yeah, Chairman, maybe just a, a couple of points in response to, to, to points made by, by committee members. Um, I, I, I would absolutely agree with the point about the collaboration that, that's, that's needed. Uh, like I think in terms of this initiative, um, there, there has to be collaboration between the public sector organisations, the local authorities ourselves, the LEOs, um, the IDA who have been mentioned, chambers, uh, etc., uh, and, and enterprise. And, and, and it, 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 so, so I think that's, that's, that's really important. I think whatever we do as well, we, we, we need to um, make sure we engage and, and develop approaches that are um, meaningful and, I suppose, are practical from an SME point of view. The typical Enterprise Ireland client, the, like it's, it's, it's 20, 30 people. They're, these are time-limited people. They face many challenges. The companies face challenges. So whatever systems we put in place or policies we put in place need to be attractive and practical from their point of view. And thirdly, I just would mention the, 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 the whole area of skills, which, which has been mentioned by a, a number of people this morning already, and, and it's something that I think we would be very focused on. Um, we, we have a programme called Spotlight on Skills, which is aimed really at helping our clients to identify their skill needs and to I suppose, put them on a path to engage with the training and the education providers to get a response to those skill needs. Um, and we, we have about 160 companies around the country who have engaged in that programme and, and working with the Department of Education and our own department, Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation, to facilitate those companies to engage with education and training and private providers to get responses. So I think there's a, there's a, a number of points that, that have been mentioned today that, that uh, we, we um, can build upon in terms of how we support. Thanks very much. Uh, Ken, I know you want to come in there. The points that, that Mark made about collaboration and coordination and, and, and Often in committees like this, we get agencies in, and, and this is no disrespect, but often they work in silos. Now, there is coordination, but to a certain degree. So on the issue that we're speaking specifically about, like who leads that collaboration? Who actually steps up to say, we'll lead this to make it happen? And in my view, it should be the likes of Enterprise Ireland, but I'm not saying you have a budget to do that at the moment. Um, but I believe we need to identify some agency that works on behalf of the state to collaborate or to coordinate all of what's going on. And 
the question I have for Mark is like, can you do that presently in your current structures or is it possible if you can't that you would make a pitch to the department or to the minister to say look this is what's happening out there, this is the new work patterns that are out there. Um, can Enterprise Ireland assist this by you know, devising um, a strategy, a national strategy to coordinate co-working or smart hubs or call it what you like. Like where is that at the moment say in, in, in Enterprise I know you're doing it you know, in individual spaces but I'm talking about taking the lead, bringing all of what we've heard today and in the past. Is it possible that Enterprise Ireland, for example, could do that? Yeah, probably something to be reflected on, um, um, Senator, I think is something we, we need to think about. But, but irrespective of, of how you lead it or, or who leads it, um, you, you have such a wide range of stakeholders involved, you have such a wide range of enterprises, there has to be collaboration. So we've had mention of, 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 of the local enterprise offices, mentioned of, of, of FDI, and, and that brings the IDA obviously into it. Ourselves, in terms of the client base, we have um, chambers, I've mentioned, small firms association. There's such a wide myriad of, of, of enterprises, and our, our enterprise base is so diverse that irrespective of who leads it or how it's driven, you, the collaboration is, is, is absolutely essential, but, but I, I take the point. Thanks very much. Um, I know Ken indicated and Orla as well, and then I'll take the next round of questions. Yeah. Um, just to look at that key as to who leads it, I, 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 I echo the Senator, I would agree that perhaps if the funding was put in place and a team was put in place, that Enterprise Ireland should be the body to lead it, but I also acknowledge that the funding may not necessarily be there under the current structures but it needs to be a dedicated team because there are a wide myriad of organisations that are involved in this. You know, you've heard from Grow Remote, Abodu, there are individual organisations already representing hubs around the country. It needs to be one coordinated approach, but this doesn't need to be overcomplicated. This is actually quite simple. Um, the issues are obvious. Within the SME sector, within Dublin, there is a huge drain on their staff at the moment. In, 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 they're in serious competition with the larger organisations to retain those staff. You know, so it's a win-win. Very simple thing to organise, you know, once the funding is put in place. Um, I just want to touch on a couple of the questions that were raised earlier on. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's good to acknowledge that policymakers have an element of catch-up to play in this scenario, but I think that comes down to the key collaboration that needs to happen now with those that are already in the space and the policymakers. Um, without overcomplicating this, this is very simple when we break it down. Um, should a specific department be involved? Yes, definitely the Department of Jobs and Innovation needs to be involved in this and needs to take a lead role, in my opinion, on this because they're already in contact with all the organisations. Um, I, I think Deputy Martin Kenny mentioned um, about the connectivity issue and one of your constituents not being able to take a role with eBay. We had a similar situation in Kerry. Uh, Amazon remote working opportunities came our way. Uh, there was about 60 positions that were advertised in the first round. Oh, we could only fill 40 of those because um, the rural broadband situation in some parts of the country, in, in the county in Kerry, they weren't able to take it. But we did fill 40 positions. So there are opportunities out there. But these things, again, can be fast-tracked using local internet service providers who would fast-track it through a wireless system. You know, we, we've proven in Listall that that can work. Um, and, and the coverage that these local internet service providers, it is demand-led, but it is far more reaching and quicker to get off the ground rather than investing in the long-term <laughs> infrastructure. Um, in regards to the regional towns, I think the framework document is there. Um, it's the framework for town centre renewal document that was published a number of years back. It just hasn't gone far enough yet. There is a collaborative town centre health check programme as part of that. There's about 12 towns in the country that have completed that programme already, which was step one. Step two was to formulate funded town teams. Unfortunately, most of those 12 towns haven't gone to that stage yet. So there is a framework there, there is a document there, we just need to go one step further. And it is, like you said, it's not always about infrastructure, it's about vibrancy, it's about sustaining local businesses. Um, it's about the pub, the shop, the restaurant, it's those businesses that if we're going to attract back the younger generation of workers, when they graduate from our colleges, we don't want them heading off to Dublin. We want to keep them in our regional towns where they went to college. Uh, Senator mentioned that earlier on in regards to Waterford. It's the same in Tralee IT at the moment. They are in that battle to retain those staff. But if we don't have a vibrant town for them to stay in, of course they're going to go off to that city. There is a framework there. We just need to go one step further on that. Um, and, and just in relation to Deputy Michael Collins, I, I'm with you on that one. Uh, I, I married a Bantry woman, so I, I empathise with the southwest area of Cork. Um, but there's a lot more that can be done in areas like that. It isn't just about the Regeneration Fund. Okay. 
Thanks very much. Um, uh, Senator uh, Rose Conway Walsh. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Orla. 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 Would you mind if I brought Orla in just a few minutes? I will do anything I have to do order You're business, so I may have to skip and come back. Would you, so. would, would no, you mind? Do you want to go ahead? We'll bring in, we'll bring in the Senator and then yes, I'll sure. bring in Zell. If you don't mind, sorry, I'm just going to do it. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Um, there's a, a lot in it, and I do want to commend um, you all for the good work that's been done. I mean, we talk about some of this as if it's innovation. I mean, I was remotely working in London almost 20 years ago without any help or any enterprise or any innovation or anything. It's just the way it worked. I went into the city four days a week, and I work, or one day a week, and I worked from, from home in, in Rayleigh for the other days, and no fuss around there. So we have an awful lot of catching up to do, an awful lot of catching up. But um, it, it, it certainly is the way forward here. It just needs to be hurried up. Now, a couple of things I want to ask you. Um, how much funding has been allocated to the LEOs since they, when, when did they start up, the LEOs? 14. 14. So since 2014, for all of the LEOs, the kind of accumulative um, staffing and administration costs, how much? I probably would have to refer to one of my colleagues in Enterprise Ireland for the total figure on that now. Uh. The annual budget uh, is uh, approximately, Senator, uh, about 35 million. Uh, 35. Is, is a, I mean, there might be slight variations on that, but, right. but, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a pretty uh, close it's, to that. It's a substantial, it is. It's a, it's a substantial uh, bu budget to provide employment uh, in, the, in the areas. Now, um, I want to ask you in relation to the fibre optic cables as well. So, what are your plans for maximising the potential around the fibre optic cables coming into the West? Sorry again, doing what? So, the transatlantic, the transatlantic fibre optic cables. Where are you with um, generating employment, enterprise development around the fibre optic cables coming in? So you're familiar with it? I'm not familiar enough with it, Senator, to probably, to, to probably answer, your, answer your question. So it's something that we, we, we might come back to the Senator on, if we could, just in terms of exact, exactly what the, what the specific role we're playing is, or, or if any. So I just need, need to come back to that, maybe. I think it's absolutely sorry, crucial. Uh, sorry, Senator, yeah. um, you might direct questions through the Chair. I and, will indeed, yeah. Um, please yeah. put them together as well. Yeah. And but we'll get the interaction that you, that you require that's necessary. Yeah, um, okay. just to find this is a more effective way in a sense. I think it's important that you would furnish the committee with uh, the progress around that because I just think it's important to hear look, that when we're talking about things, we're talking about things in, in the round and we talked about the interaction um, and the co collaboration between the different agencies, between the different resources that are there. And to me, the fibre optic cable is a huge resource that's coming so that, into the West and it's one of the, it presents an opportunity. I, I, I agree totally, but again, it's, it's another department as well, community communications, energy, natural resources, mm. that particular department. You have a department of business yeah. innovation here. And, you have and other, you have other yeah. people from, from Leo, yes. uh, Offaly. Yes. Um, you have a private company doing fabulous yes. work in Indeed. remote working. It's really about remote working here. Absolutely. And therein the problem lies, is that yes. we can no longer afford to work in, solos, in, in silos. And I know that there is a certain amount of collaboration it's vitally important. This is the biggest thing that's happened in the west of Ireland for a long, long time. Yes. Having, a, having the, the highest speeds coming through, and there's another, an, another cable to be coming through shortly. I think there's another one from, from, uh, from Iceland to be done as well. And unless we make, um, unless we take advantage of those things, and unless we plan ahead, and unless we work very closely uh, with those things, we're never going to maximise the potential uh, of, of the west and of rural Ireland. Um, I want to ask you maybe as well about your connection, say, with the likes of AIR, because one of the biggest barriers we have, say, I work remotely as well from here on the days that I'm not here, and I never know in the morning whether I can send an email or not. So I, I admire the fact that you think that there's a broadband picture there, that everything is wonderful. I can tell you from personal experience that is not the way. Um, and the other thing is, 
air, the problems with, I also don't know if I can make a mobile phone call. Or maybe five or six times during a conversation, my phone will cut out and then I kind of get through to air. So you have all those problems. So I just wonder as agencies, what, um, have you sat down with air? Have you discussed the problems we have in the mobile phone coverage, for instance? It's a fairly basic requirement and any business or operation from home. Yeah, Grant. Sorry, do you want to just I think we'll take that at the end, um, okay. Senator, so you okay. might conclude your questions. Okay, this, will be, this yeah. will be more difficult in there. I also want to ask you around Knock Airport in terms of if you had discussions there, maybe about connecting flights to, to Brussels, because I think that will be a really interest and it will be a, really, a, a real help as well coming uh, from the West. Um, I want to ask your interaction with LEADER as well, because I absolutely concur with your, your, audit, your, your audit skills report. I know LEADER did many of these in many of the counties, and what I wouldn't want is that we're reinventing the wheel, if you like, or wasting resources in that if those audits are already there, and they're already done by the LEADER companies, which they had been you know, before. I know we have the different col uh, collaborations of LEADER now. Um, you know, those things were being done when I worked myself um, with the, the enterprise companies. Um, the other thing I want to ask you is about the other natural resources that are used in terms of developing employment and enterprise. Um, so we have uh, seaweed, I suppose, is one of my things, and I know there are a lot of good products made from seaweeds, but what interaction you have, again, with the licensing around uh, some of these uh, natural resources as well. I want to ask you in terms of the Disruptive Technologies Innovation Fund, um, how much of that funding uh, actually went outside. I know there was 27 projects approved uh, for 70 million. How many of those went into the more rural areas outside uh, Cork, Dublin and Galway? Um, because I think it's very important that I, I think when applications are being assessed sometimes the criteria can be very narrow and I think we need to weigh them in or weight them in favour of the rural areas. That's not to say that they wouldn't meet the criteria. But if we have, a, for example, a technology company in Valmollet, a successful company, then we need to look at that in the sense that how can we support that? Because 20 jobs in, in an area like Valmollet or Eris can be the same as 2,000 as there is in Dublin. And when you have the innovation and the technology there and all of those things, I think we need to harness that and we need to encourage it and support it with resources directly down to the people who are making the difference uh, in, in these uh, communities. I would have the same concerns around the centralisation and privatisation of things, but centralisation of around the, the, the hospitals and the medical services as well that will prevent people from moving in and staying in the more rural areas. Um, and education is connected up as well, even in terms of school transport. You know, people moving into an area and then finding out that, and relocating and setting up their business, and then finding out there's no space for their children on the school bus. So all of these things uh, connect up. But also I want to ask you in terms of the curriculum. Um, how do you feel that you have changed the curriculum in the primary schools or the secondary schools in terms of matching up the, the skill sets with the jobs of the present and the jobs of the future, uh, particularly in relation to uh, technology. You know, is the hardware there, is the software there, is, has the curriculum been changed? Because I have always found the curriculum to be slow to be changed. Is it changed in terms of languages? How many schools do we have that are, that are learning Mandarin or some of these markets that um, were opened up here to four? Or are schools still um, um, stuck in doing the languages that maybe we did 20 years ago? I know there's a lot there. And also I have order of business, so I'm not going to ask any more. Uh, thanks very much, Senator. Um, I, I'm going to bring in Deputy O'Keefe um, after maybe the witnesses would take an opportunity to address some of the questions. Obviously, I don't believe you're in a position to answer quite a lot of what the Senator has asked, from seaweed to um, a few transport school buses and you name it, it's all in there. But you might try and do your best to, to address some of the questions. Ro Rowena, please. 
Chairman, and uh, thank you, Senator, for the questions. I will address some of the points, I think, that, that were raised and some others not so specifically. I think the key point you're making relating to the enabling infrastructure in terms of broadband and so on, it is critically important. I think everyone around here recognises that. And I mean, a role that Enterprise Ireland plays is we, we sit on the National Competitiveness Council. It's our role to identify and to hear from our clients what are the issues that are, that are outside our direct mandate, are outside our direct control, but that are impacting on their, their ability to develop and so on. And we, in, we influence and impact through that. And these are the type of issues that are very, very pertinent to, to, to our clients um, and, and to enterprises across the country. I suppose just in relation to the Disruptive Technologies Innovation Fund, I don't have the exact breakdown, but I think it's important to know that the criteria for that fund specifically required collaboration that included SMEs. It was, it was something that was, and it's, it, it, it was, it's, a, it's a criteria that I think can and will be mirrored in other type of collaborative uh, uh, funding programs into the future, because it is critically important that what we do see between large and small co companies is the ability to, to leverage the, the um, um, to kind of it maximise spillovers and, and, and to allow for, uh, for SMEs to compete and to be, to be able to, 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 to achieve uh, um, growth in, in this area. Um, and finally, I suppose, in relation to um, other areas, I, I, I think just going back to what has been mentioned earlier about skills needs and, and so on of our, age, of, our, of our enterprises, it is critically important that our SMEs are supported, which is what we are doing through the Spotlight and Skills Programme, in actually, first of all, identifying what their skills needs are, and then following that, being, uh, being helped and assisted to, to engage with education providers and to have a voice with education providers. So when you talk about curriculum, that, that what our education providers know and are aware of is what are the needs of our SMEs, not just perhaps of, of, of larger companies, um, and, and particularly be it our education providers in, in regional locations, that they are actually responding to skills needs in that area, in particular sectoral clusters. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rowena. I want to bring on Orla there, please. So just, uh, I suppose, maybe just to add a little bit on the role of the broadband officers. So there's 31 broadband officers across the local authority network, and they are playing a very significant role between the providers and the funders. So they're identifying the different black spots, um, both for the broadband and mobile phone coverage. Um, they're, they're involved in a lot of different pilots and, um, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of different funding applications, and they're developing regional and local digital plans as well. So they're accessing funding independently and feeding into the national picture. So I think they are doing quite a lot in that area and are working, for example, with leader funded community hubs as well as ourselves and different different agencies and providers around the region. Um, we so leader we work very closely with them. Just in terms of curriculum, um, I suppose from our point of view, the LEOs are heavily involved in the delivery of entrepreneurship programmes through the you know, student enterprise programmes. And so we work with, it's the largest programme throughout the country in terms of involvement with um, students. It is something we would like to get added to the curriculum. We're in discussions with the Department of Education on that. Um, so that's, I suppose, another area. And just maybe to pull, to refer very quickly back to the area of um, the questions and comments on collaboration. Just to remember the newly launched regional enterprise plans, I was just mentioning that they, a number of them, have strategic objectives and supporting actions regarding um, remote working. And the, the, the groups working on the regional action plans, um, they're completely collaborative across all areas and all stakeholders, including enterprise, all the agencies and, and related bodies. So I think that's very useful. And even in Offaly, like in terms of we're part of the Midlands one, um, there, are different, there are different initiatives to improve the remote working connectivity between the hubs, to also look at a campaign to approach companies in Dublin to encourage remote working and to see about the, um, the interest in coming back and setting up in the Midlands. What might be useful in terms of overall coordination is the sharing of best practice between the different plans around the country. And um, lastly, just I think promotion, the promotion of the whole area of remote working to the larger employers would be very useful. Um, I, I know I think we, we sent details there. We have uh, Leo Offaly, we're organising a half-day conference during Enterprise Week. And it's all on the area, and it's 
um, practical insights and guides for both employers and employees. So I think, think that there's definitely a growing momentum for the remote working and smart working, but it would be great to have additional education and learning around it. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to come in at this stage? Yeah. Um, first of all, you're all very welcome, and I managed to hear some of the submissions when I was up in the office. Um, I think the hubs are the key of a practical action that can be done at the moment. And it needs to be done now because maybe in five years' time we won't have half the demand for them. Because reality is, I'd hoped that we would have ubiquitous fibre broadband to every building in this country. So the first thing I have to put my cards on the table to say, I will not rest easy until we put fibre into every building in this country. If we were able to put electricity, water and all those basic services, fibre should be just seen the same way. And I don't believe that fibre technology will date. There will be better wireless technologies, but they will never match fibre in a fixed location. It's a tiny little bit of a cable, it does your television, it does your business and so on. Now my understanding of the co-working hubs is that at the moment they have two functions. One, that they provide broadband for broadband isn't available. For example, where I live we have 100 houses with broadband, we have 300 houses without broadband, we have fibre broadband in 100. There's some of us, I think about 20 of us have 60, 70 meg, and then the rest are down to 5 meg or nothing. And obviously they have a big problem, the people are outside the little, and I live in a very, very rural area, the, the 100 houses. So for the business directly linked, they're not going to use a hub. They're going to just use it in situ. Uh, however, it will be, even if the broadband, the National Broadband Plan, <laughs> Uh, contracts awarded next month. It will be, I'd imagine, three, four, five years before they fully roll it out. AIR haven't stuck to their targets of the rollout of the previous one. It's going to be the, well into the mid-year before that's completed the 300,000 houses. So you're now getting to more difficult terrain, 500,000 houses, you can figure out the time scale yourself. So I believe that the first need is what I've outlined. The second need is because there's a socialisation issue involved. In other words, some people could work from home, but they like to be able to go in for their other people and interact. But I, what I would imagine will happen is if everybody had fibre broadband in the home, like all of us, every TD in this house, you work from wherever you are at any given moment. And most people don't work just in eight, eight hour days. So I would imagine sometimes they'll go down and work in the hub, and a lot of the times they'll work from home, and other times they'll work from airports or wherever the hell they happen to be. Uh, and I think we need to look at it in that context um, and therefore that the need for the hubs will continue but it's going to change and it mightn't be for as long hours. Um, now, I'd like to compliment Udras Nugaltata who are the missing from this particular feast because Udras Nugaltata have a lot of buildings around the Gualtas and they've systematically been looking at empty buildings and they're putting in what they call GCOM, in other words, hot desks, so on, so on, so on. And uh, that has been very positive. Now, listening to Enterprise Ireland this morning, an issue that I constantly can't get my head around was that whenever they split IDA up into Enterprise Ireland and IDA, they left all of the buildings in rural Ireland under the IDA. So IDA owned properties in Roundstone and County Galway and all sorts of bizarre places from an IDA FDI perspective. And it seems to me that there isn't a coordinated approach to say, look, what's the full, and I, we got it through the committee, a full portfolio of what the IDA have. What are all the buildings? How many of these are in full use and how many of these could be translated into GCOMs? Just as Uthras have done. Uh, and my question to the IDA, or to Enterprise Ireland this morning, have you discussed this with the IDA and said, are you willing to make your buildings available, parts of them? For example, there's a factory where I live, and there's a self-contained, like nearly unit within it that has a few rooms, place making tea, toilets and whatever, and you can go in the front door and you needn't interfere with the rest of the factory building that's unfortunately at the moment empty, but would still be available for letting. And 
we can get. So we, if idea factories, most of these have suites of um, suites of uh, offices and so on that uh, you might be able to use. So my, my, my simple question is, has there been joined up thinking here between yourselves in the IDA? And maybe I just extend the question a little bit further. Because um, one of our witnesses just has to go, oh, yeah. uh, Vanessa Tierney from uh, Abo Abodu. Yeah. And I just want to thank you so much for, for coming here today. Just final words. I know you have to go. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. And sorry that I, I'm leaving um, early. It's actually to meet the CEO of Vodafone. <laughs> so I will bring up a lot of the issues that were raised today. Um, I would highlight, and I haven't uh, with some of the, the questions that have come up prior, previously, but we've had over 20,000 people register. So it's not just the couple of hundred or the 2,000 now in Wexford, over 20,000. We've had over 500 companies register. The demand is there for smart working. Obviously, the 200 co-working, we're engaging with 31 Leos. So slowly together, we're bringing it together. But I will bring up one thing on the skills because I think it's fundamental with the development of AI and machine learning. What's going to become really key as humans is our soft skills, our cognitive learning, our ability to connect. And um, we're building technology in the background to be able to match people because a lot of us are going to have multiple career paths. Um, so that's just something that I would bring. And finally, if you haven't already seen it, a national survey was done between Abodu and Vodafone on the whole country for the appetite for smart working, remote working, and it, it gives an interesting read. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Vanessa. And best wishes. So my question to, I suppose, to Enterprise Ireland, you know, have you a policy of setting up these? Uh, centres, uh, work hubs, have you discussed with IDA? And on the wider question, has there been any discussion about transferring all of the rural properties that are never going to be used for classical FDI from abroad over to Enterprise Ireland? And that the property owner and the, uh, you know, most of the successful industries I find around rural Ireland are actually indigenous not foreign, because the big multinational, anybody who's big enough to come here is likely to want to go near to a city. But there are, there's enough talent within this country to create massive employment in rural Ireland. But, and your much better market, much more likely market, is actually people maybe worked in the past in FTI, or just people who are smart and whatever and have ideas, and I can think of near where I am, where we have a lot of employment, just very smart local people who got the job done. Um, so that, that's a question. Now, I'm focusing big time on the physical thing. That's national rollout of broadband and on the hubs. Because my experience is that at the moment, without any of the soft supports, there are endless amount of people just looking for it tomorrow. They were looking for it at the last election as we canvassed the houses one by one. Because there are a huge other cohort of people who work in cities or whatever commute who could reduce the commute to two days a week if they could work from home. Who could be at home in the midterms and all the other family friendly things we want people to do and still keep the work going if they could work from home. Uh, and that's a huge market for facilitating rural li living. And if I might say so, it might so solve some of the urban traffic problems. Uh, it was just fantastic driving into Galway on Monday morning. I couldn't believe it. I went in in jig time at the rush hour. And it was only then I suddenly realized it was midterm and half the parents of the country were off and half the school, all the schools were closed. So this is multifaceted. But funny enough, I don't think we have to do much to educate the people about this. I think what they're saying is, yeah, yeah, it's a great idea, but I don't have broadband. Will you just give us, or I don't have a facility to access broadband in my village. Will you just give it to us? Because we already have an awful lot of businesses in rural land and houses when you start. And that's the final question I have. Has anybody, and maybe the rural broadband officer could answer the question, have we any idea how many people where there is broadband are now working partially from home. Uh, and that would give you an extrapolation for the 600,000 houses that don't have commercial broadband, an extrapolation of how many would work from home. 
without any further source, soft supports because the people who are already doing it in the areas that have it did it off their own bat. Uh, if we could just get the physical thing there because it's great of all the supports that you're know, encouraging people to use a thing that doesn't exist. As I often say, when Alexander invented the telephone, he had no marketing survey done. But once a good idea took hold, the rest is history. And that took a fair while. But when somebody invented the mobile phone, what always fascinated me was doing a constituency clinic, because I was there just when I came up here, first of all, you had a brick of a mobile phone and they were as scarce as hen's teeth. And once the small phone poker, the little small version came out and it became relatively cheap, everybody was coming in with them and I would have some of my constituents who would come in and they wouldn't be exactly technology savvy and I'd say, what's your phone number? And he'd pull out the phone in the pocket and it would be written on the back of it, stuck with a bit of sellotape, but they still were using it for every purpose they wanted it for. And I find very few people nowadays come in to me without a smartphone and they have that because they're using the apps. So I think people adopt to technology. I think people are smart. There's a huge interaction in people in this country. Small little country, we're very strange people. I think the problem we have is the physical availability. Uh, thanks, Deputy. I'm just going to bring in Deputy Martin Kenny there. Is a brief question. Briefly, there's another thing I just was thinking about there in regard to skills. Um, one of the, the key issues for any work environment is for people to be able to enhance their skills in their employment um, environment. And remote working, uh, are there challenges around that? Because obviously you don't have 50 people working together. You don't have whatever, you know what I mean? That it, it, that, that it, back to that thing of, of, of either partial or full isolation that a person may have from their work colleagues. And I, I just wonder you know, what, what means can, can be for to develop that. Uh, secondly, in regard to the, the hubs and the whole issue of the hubs, uh, one of the most successful hubs I know is in Drumshambo where we have a food hub, which has been a, subs a huge success and has, has, has you know, been tremendous. And also, in, indeed, in Manor Hamilton, there's a hub there as well around technology. But, you know, one of the problems and one of the key things that, that, that made that happen was that there were a couple of individuals that had the idea, caught a hold of it and ran with it. And uh, in many areas, you know, there's, there's despondency. People, first of all, you don't have the broadband and then you don't have this and you don't. And there's too many don'ts and don't haves for people to be get that confidence for to be able to grab it and run with it. And, and I, just, I just would like to tease out that a little bit as to what, what needs to be done for to develop the capacity within communities for to be able to, to lift themselves up out of all of that. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Deputy. Um, no more questions there, um, Mr. Cristal. Yeah, Chairman, thank you. Yeah, in, 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 in respect to uh, Deputy O'Keefe's uh, uh, questions and uh, comments, maybe just a, a couple of uh, points. Um, first of all, uh, as he rightly identifies, the, the responsibility for the, for the property portfolio is with, is with the IDA. They're mandated to do it, and they're, they're, they're best to talk about the full range of properties that are available to support FDI. But, but what I would stress and, and, and reassure the Deputy that there is ongoing and, co and collaboration between ourselves and the IDA at, at national level and regional level in terms of, of this initiative and a number of initiatives. Um, if, for example, if I, it's, it's co-working and, and in terms of the development of the co-working spaces that we have, we, we have supported, whether that's tr true, like as I mentioned earlier on and, and was in our submission, the, we've, 64 million has been invested by ourselves in terms of the community enterprise centres, the regional accelerators, and, and, and for example, we re recently um, uh, launched, Mr Humphreys launched the Enterprise Development plan from the Port Shed and Galway again, which is a really good example of, of, of collaboration between ourselves and, and the IDA in, 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 in those sort of hubs and facilities, and also the business, business innovation centres. But specifically, I think what we talk about and collaborate with the IDA is we obviously have, a, have the remit for the development of, of high potential startup companies, and again, how we can kind of work with the IDA um, to, to, to develop those and, 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 and to, to, to use facilities that, that are there. Specifically, as well, other areas that we, we collaborate with the IDA on and are very focused on, we have an agenda around second sites, which is about uh, companies, Enterprise Ireland companies, who are establishing and expanding their presence to expand it in regional locations as opposed to, 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 to city or, or urban locations. And, and finally, uh, 
as the deputy will be aware, we do have responsibility for the food FDI agenda, um, where, where the IDA hold the, the agenda for the, for, for the wider sectors. We hold responsibility for, for food FDI, and we, we collaborate very much with, with the IDA on, again, available properties and the appropriate properties to support that sector. Thanks very much, uh, Orla. Thank, Thank you very much. But you don't. Uh, would you consider looking at what all the rest are doing? Because it seems to me, from what you're saying, that the light years ahead. They're looking at all their properties because it's all, all in one portfolio. They're looking at all their properties and they're saying, "Look, we have space in properties. We have a latent demand." You see, all the time we're talking about the person who's at your door, but there's a latent demand there for. GTEC or whatever you want to call them in English, uh, for digital working hubs. We have the buildings, just make sure that you have the tea making facilities, the fibre connected in, the toilets in operating order, and some way of making sure that there's some security in the place and there's some key system whatever for and let them in. Now, it doesn't seem to me that Enterprise IDA, and I don't really care between the two because as I used always point out since they came into this house, there's only one government in this country. All the agencies seem to operate as if there were 50 governments in the country. Is there a policy, or would you consider looking at what IDA or UTRAS are doing and taking a leaf out of the book between yourselves and IDA and just getting on with the job? Well, just again to reassure the deputy, we would in the last week we have worked very closely with UDROS. We we support them in, in terms of the, of the business enterprise development that they that they lead in in the in the Gaeltacht regions. Uh, within the last week, I've met with the senior management team in UDROS, and it's an ongoing uh, conversation. So we we we're happy. Anything we can learn from 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 UDROS or other agencies, we're happy to to do so. It's best to ask them to show the G comments they're doing. Thanks, deputy. Um, could they bring in Orla and then Ken, please? Thank you. Um, just with regard to the skills, um, I, I suppose in a lot of the co-working um, spaces that we're involved in, the Leos are working with, with the clients there to help them in terms of enterprise training, network, business development. So that is happening and it's open to tenants of the, tenants of the co-working space that may be working just one day a week in a co-working <laughs> hub and the rest of the day is up with, with a, a business in, in a larger city. So that is taking place. I referenced um, the new one we're going to be starting, Stream Creative Suite, and that very much has a very strong, because that's to do with data, big data, we're linking in with courses on data analytics with provision by AIT, Trinity and some of the skill nets and, and other groupings, private sector as well. So that's going to be a strong aspect of that new hub and, and other, other hubs are doing similar things. Um, also the libraries, the, a lot of them are working on um, developing the e-platforms. They have a lot of new journals, reports and materials online and I know even from talking to our Head of Library in, in Offaly, that's up 70% in terms of usage in the last year. And that linked in with the open library systems, you know, feeds in very well with this whole area of remote working. And just very quickly with regard to the difference maybe between working in a co-working hub and perhaps working from the home, even if broadband was available at home, um, there are some, we have, we, we have clients who tell us that their businesses have specified that they need to be working from a co-working hub and not from a converted room at home. There are plenty of people who feel they need the discipline. And then back to even the point about social skills, the social interaction and engaging with different people from different backgrounds or different levels of business have been very beneficial to people working in hubs. Very good. Thanks, Orla. Uh, Ken? Yeah, I just want to <coughs> address a couple of things. I'm very familiar with the... ...about have we any data on where there is uh, fibre to the home and the number of people who are fully or partially working from home or is that one of the hidden secrets of Ireland? No, no, um, I, I'm not personally aware of it but I would need to certainly we can revert back I'd need to talk to the broadband officers of the network I, I'm not familiar uh, I'm not aware of that uh, if research has taken place on that or what the outcomes I don't know if anybody else has like that All I know is this but it's anecdotal well not anecdotal but it's not a scientific survey the number of people who are coming to me just outside the broadband area saying, I need broadband, I need it for my business, I need it for my life, it's very, very high. To be quite honest, and I've said this, and I know lots of people get mad at me when I'm honest enough to admit it, but I'm going to say it again. During the last election, it wasn't post offices that you were getting at the doors, it was broadband. 
straight and simple broadband. And obviously that was, you know, across the board. It wasn't as age specific as you think, but it peaked obviously in the 30 to 45 you know, working pairs, da da da, group. Uh, but what I think we need to know, or try to find out, is you know, where we have it, how many people use it for their business, part time, full time, whatever. You know, you ask the question do you use it for your business or whatever? Three hours a week, 20 hours a week, full time. Because I think we need to get that. I totally accept the thing you're saying about socialisation. We, can, we could, I don't know, are the witnesses in a position to answer that? So, we can, as a committee, we can write on your behalf to the Department of Communications, maybe, to you know, ascertain that the answer to that question. But it so, seems to me um, that maybe we should write to the broadband officers to see would some county just do it. We can, we can arrange to do that as well. Um, no it would hugely strengthen the case for rural broadband if we know the economic effect it's having. It becomes then the provision becomes a lost leader. That is a lot of gain if it is as prevalent to demand as I think it is. Thanks, everybody. And perhaps you might write back to the clerk. I um, just want to bring, bring in Ken now, please. Yeah, I just want to specifically focus in on Deputy O'Keefe's um, point in relation to Woodross and the GTEC hubs. Um, I'm very uh, familiar with the hubs. I, I suppose the one thing I would do is express caution. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of a number of hubs that have been established, community-led ones, through various funds that are still idle. Um, I, I think all investment into these hubs has to be demand-led, or at least have the avenue where we're going to, who's going to fill these hubs. There's no point in making commitments to local communities to say we're going to put a hub in your region, we're going to give you the broadband, and then no one goes and work there because there's no economic benefit to that, that town. And this is not anecdotal. I, I, I'm very aware of hubs that are vacant um, because the, either the infrastructure wasn't right, or was. There was no demand for those hubs, or there isn't a, an avenue and a connection with EI IDA to provide this as a landing pad solution for companies that are actually interested in those locations. Um, it isn't always about developing hubs. In some cases, remote working might be the solution, a better solution, a home working solution for those rural towns where we enable their homes and they can work from home. And I get the point in relation to the isolation of working from home. I myself did it for 18 months. That's what drove me to set up our hub. Um, and about you know we about 30 percent of the people in our in our three hubs are remote workers and some of those are there one day a week two days a week just to make that connection with other people um, because they would have come from large city offices where they would have been surrounded by hundreds of people to their house 10 20 miles outside the nearest large town so I, you know I, I get that but caution in regards to the development of hubs um, because it is a waste of investment in those towns when there is probably a better solution to provide an employment to those towns. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, we've been joined by Deputy Rabbit. Um, you're very welcome. Thank I know you, you're Chair. very much involved in Port in a, in a hub there. Yes. And you made a very valuable contribution at the last meeting here. So I'll be short the, and the sweet. The floor is yours, Deputy <laughs> Rabbit. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the opportunity to ask a few questions. I suppose one of them is directed directly to your good selves for, from, from Offaly. I would have looked at your Facebook page and I would have looked at your web page and everything else. And I think that's where a lot of business led, as Ken would have said, hubs would be looking to where you need to have have an anchor tenant and I held a discovery day a couple of weeks ago in Portumna and of that Enterprise Ireland might be interested to hear one of a number of employees from a particular large financial institution based in Limerick have 30 cars going across the bridge every single morning where they have a capacity issue where they want to expand and they don't have car parking and it would mean an ideal location would be that sort of idea where you can expand from and from there I went into your website to see how leaders or LEOs get right in, in behind behind it and I thought your your web page was fantastic. It gave me a good steer around Offaly and what had to be about. But I suppose one of my questions the last day was in relation to the rollout of the Leos and the support that they play. Like, do ye meet on a um, bi monthly, do ye meet half yearly to share information from one Leo to another? Because earlier on I heard on the contributions, 34 million is available there to Leo to support businesses and everything else. But it's the sharing of that information that every county council is on the same platform. That's one of the questions is. The second question I'm wondering is, also, how can we get the dis changed idea concept into the schools? 
because I actually think this is, when you talk about the library, absolutely, the library is a valuable tool, be it if you're in second level or if you're in third level needing to finish your projects. Possibly not for the high-end stuff of attracting business, I don't agree with the libraries, but definitely from the end of third level, second level kids who want to complete their projects, I could see that. Is there a plan there with Leo, with Enterprise Ireland, of delivering that model to educate children of using different units that are available to complete it, as opposed to spending their weekends within a Galway because they can't get their broadband above in Banley Hill, but if you actually go down the road to Abbey or go into Kilimer, there's a there's a library, there's whatever available that you can... We need to train, ch train children how to do their study patterns a little bit different. Would you agree with that? And Enterprise Ireland, going forward, how are we going to engage with these businesses, these banks, these businesses that have a capacity issue where accommodation to accommodate their employees, they can't get it, the, the premium levels are so high. Are you looking to the wider sphere as in the one hour commute? So the Portumnus to the Galways, to the, the Portumna who is an anchor, who is an hour from Limerick, who is an hour from Galway and an hour from Athlone, and you have the same yourself chair, no different in your own area, that we need to look at these towns, commuter towns, and where are we looking to the buildings? And I talk about buildings. When I talk about buildings, I talk about the Dowger House in Portumna, which is owned by the OPW, which is completely kitted out, as opposed to having these um, businesses going again and buying. Why aren't we reusing the properties that are available? And what engagements are you having with other department agencies? And I talk about the OPW, where they have very good buildings that are not used, that could be used uh, and they have car parking spaces, they would have it all, but would keep uh, towns alive. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to take some Orla? Thanks. Thank you very much and thanks for the kind comments on the Facebook and website pages. Um, the local enterprise offices, yes, we meet, the heads of enterprise meet um, probably six or eight times a year and other um, teams within the local enterprise offices meet a number of times a year and it's all about that information sharing, sharing the best practice, looking to see what works in some regions and what might be replicated and, um, and then we meet on a regional basis as well to drive actions through um, the, the regional enterprise plans and, and such like. So that is happening. In terms of the libraries, um, yes, through the Work Matters programmes, I suppose we'd find people going in there, um, they, the libraries have put in a lot of supports for people looking at setting up their own businesses and um, researching, even doing patent searches and things like that, and looking up the likes of VisionNet. And so they can sit and, and work on that. So that's, that's what I'm kind of saying in terms of a pre-startup. And um, so we link in with them there. Um, with regard to students and enterprise we have we, we have run different schemes where students working on student enterprise projects would um, we've given them the facility to come in and meet with some of the maybe design experts in some of our co-working spaces and they've given some of their time pro bono to help them working on different projects and we've also facilitated um, student groups working for European competitions, youth entrepreneurship competitions and again through the likes of um, the Junction Business Innovation Centre but that sort of thing has been replicated I think throughout the country with other LEOs. Thanks. Um, I should call in the Chief Executive of Offaly uh, County Council Ms. Anne-Marie Delaney, and apologies, I didn't give you your title when I it's introduced okay. you earlier on. It's okay, Chair. You're very welcome. Thank you. My Thanks. grandmother was from Affley. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm a leash woman. So. <laughs> um, but just to, just to add to what Orla has, um, has said there in relation to the link into education and schools, and I suppose the structures that we would have, I suppose through Corlin and Oag system as well, we would have a significant amount of projects and initiatives, and a number of those around entrepreneurship. I know Offaly Corla have done a significant programme on entrepreneurship and it links into the student um, schemes then as well and they enter into the national competitions and have performed well. And I suppose our own broadband officer as well, who also coincidentally is, 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 works with our IT department, um, has made application under the Digital Innovation Fund, a successful application under the Digital Innovation Fund for a robotics project with primary schools and that's an innovative one that's just kicking off at the moment and he's had the first few schools in last week. Um, so that's another area I suppose if we're looking at kind of new technology and linking into what's, I suppose, part of the, the fabric of the county in terms of the scientific aspect of it and the ILO for Embar and the, the, the Stream Creative Suite, but also developing things around
on new technologies. And um, I suppose we have a few more plans around that as well in terms of the funding streams that are available there under the Digital Innovation Fund. Um, our, library, our libraries, and I suppose in terms of use, it, students utilising the library service and new forms of study patterns and study mechanisms, the open library system has been piloted in Offaly. Um, it's now been rolled out around the country and it's been very successful in terms of utilising, I suppose, off-peak times for students, uh, allowing them access to internet provision, um, providing resources there for them as well. And I suppose it also, um, from, the, from the, I suppose, the junior schools, primary schools and second level schools, there's a number of initiatives there held on Saturdays and at weekends and in the evenings for students um, to, uh, in terms of kind of development, mental skills, um, Healthy Ireland, the Lego programme and a number of others that they have been using there um, to try and encourage uh, children, I suppose, in terms of education and research and utilising the services and resources that are available in the library there. So, thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, I bring in there, Mark. Chairman, yeah, just a, a, a number of comments in, in respect to the, the point raised by the, by, by, by the deputy. Um, first of all, in terms of the coordination of the LEOs um, and, and the point raised, there is um, um, a significant effort goes in to ensure that there's shared learning across the across the local enterprise offices, and um, we have a, a dedicated team in, in in Enterprise Ireland based in our Shannon office, which we call the, the Leo Centre of Excellence, and their job is to work with Orla and the, and and the, and the respective managers. Bring, bring the 31 heads of LEO together, share information, sh share best practice, and, and we're very much supported by the local authorities in, in, in that agenda. We have a national steering group as well, which uh, um, Anne-Marie is, is, is a member of, as well as myself, which again, at a policy level, share, shares ideas and best practice. In, in respect of, of, of property and um, and without hopefully not repeating some of the points that I raised earlier on, we do very much work, work with, 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 the, with the IDA and, and, to, and to collaborate as best we can in respect of property needs. Second sites and the development of it is a key, is, is a key objective for EI. What we mean by second sites is where there are enterprise Ireland companies who are growing or expanding, that, they, that we are working with them to identify that they, as opposed to expanding, if, it's a, if they're based in Dublin or Cork, that they might consider expanding their, 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 their business uh, in, 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 uh, in, in a rural location. And we have some really good examples of that. Abtran um, uh, last year, Cairn uh, as well, really good uh, uh, companies who have, have uh, developed second sites in regional locations and brought an awful lot to the region that they, that they, they, they moved to. Um, I'd also mention the, the, the REDF. And which is the Regional Enterprise Development Fund, um, only because it's again it was it's it's the 42 projects we funded, and a number of those projects were about developing of existing facilities that that are there. So it wasn't a focus on new builds or new new entities. Very much about seeing what what what's existing in rural locations and what can we do through the fund and the partners involved in those in those uh, um, projects to. Um, Develop those facilities in those, in those, those particular locations. Is, is that a rolling fund? Can you apply at any stage, or is there a window you have to apply? And how does that work? Um, no, it's not a rolling fund. There, there was there was two particular calls. So it called one uh, closed in 2017, call two uh, last year, um, and um, that, that's, so those funds are, are, are finished and, and closed. There's no new one available currently. Well, no, no. The the, 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 the minister has talked about the, um, the that uh, it being uh, the, 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 I suppose consideration is underway for what a, a third fund might look like. Um, but what it also would flag as well the existing funds that are there, the rural fund and the urban fund, which have been mentioned by the committees, and, and uh, um, the, the, the importance of obviously and the disruptive technologies fund, which as well has been mentioned. So um, the, the REDF is a specific fund and third call not yet not yet rolled out. Um, I just bring in Deputy Rabbit. Just a supplementary and I think Mark is for your good self again. Um, when, when Sorry, apologies. When I was asking that specific question, I suppose I was really asking more in relation to the service industries. And I suppose when I was asking it, it was to do with the likes of banks that would actually, where they're hitting capacity and they want to expand, okay? And we have properties. And, they, and I'm not talking about the idea now. I'm talking about we in, the, in this country, we have a budget of over 100 million for the maintenance of some of our OPW sites. We have guard stations closed down. We have various houses that a huge amount of money has been invested into down through the years that are left at a very, very high standard in very, very central locations. And I'm wondering where the Enterprise Ireland is liaising with the Minister 
with actually accessing some of these buildings who would need very, very little um, investment to bring them to usage. Thank you. Thanks, Chair, that's all. Yeah, a, 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 so maybe something to be taken under consideration. I, I, I think it's something to reflect on. Again, I, I just would, would um, uh, what, what drives our, our engagement in terms of, of property and property development is the needs of our companies, and and and, it's the, and, and, and the companies are expanding and, and growing. So um, it's it's that, that's the, the key the key driver. Where those properties come from, or, or, or what they look like, is, is then, of course, is influenced heavily by what by what what the needs of the companies are in the sector that they have. So something maybe we, we could maybe just consider and reflect on. If that's okay. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I, I Debbie O'Keefe. Briefly, I often note in all the discourse now we talk about Dublin, we talk about rural towns and cities, and. We keep forgetting that there's 1.5 million people living, that's a third of our population, outside of the towns or villages. Now, if you had a city with a third of the population in it, it'd be a hell of a city. You have one in Dublin. And we keep noticing that. And it's servicing, your know, rural Ireland actually is predominantly outside the towns and villages. And no matter how long and how often and how you know, strong the feeling in the Department of Housing Planning and Planning and Planning and Planning, and it is. Irish people are very attached to their non-nucleated villages. Um, and living in one of those places that's highly enterprising, I don't find that the so-called, you know, we get these, this literature telling us we think better when we're in the city. No, I don't find I think any better up here than I do down below. I don't find that when I migrated to the West, I became less creative. I actually became a lot more creative because necessity does. I don't find my local population any less creative, and I defy anybody to say, given the suite of lack of infrastructure over the years, that in fact they haven't been a hell, you know, incredibly creative overcoming. But we just seem to not understand that there's an Ireland out there that's just been written off the geography. Um, and most people in the, expect that Ireland to travel. Of course, what this does is allow that Ireland stay at home and work from where they are. And, uh, you know, I just think it's a pity that all the time, all the documents we get seem to talk about towns, 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 as if there was nobody in that third didn't exist. We do exist. And I keep pointing to one interesting thing. I know, I know Killarney eventually got the better of Monnachta, but it was David and Goliath, but pound for pound, they put a hell of a battle up for 400 of a population against the whole of the town of Killarney, and it's Interland, as they call it. St. Thomas's are still in the shake. And I think you're up against Belly Hale, Chamrocks. Not. Well, we're not exactly down town Manhattan either. And the other interesting thing is the final finalist is Corofin, and there's not a town in sight. Corofin's a tiny village. I'd say there wouldn't be two players coming from the actual village of Corofin. So what I'm saying is we're a rural committee here. Towns are part of rural Ireland, but they are not rural Ireland. And I think we have to keep remembering that. And it's tiny. I mean, the idea that there's any geographic problem servicing all rural Ireland. They had a dream in Australia. I think it was a little bit ambitious of putting fibre into every house in Australia. Now, some place in the outback, you might go 10 or 20 or 30 miles to get a house. I know of nowhere in Ireland where it's impossible to service water or electricity. And we've done it for the electricity. Um, one thing that does disturb me, I have to say, that we, the state seems to have just grasped that fibres like electricity, you just stick it in, you just put it in and do it. And having to depend on private people's you know, you know, ingenious leader companies, whatever, to try to create a basic resource, thanks be to God we didn't do that with electricity. That early in, the, in our history, we just decided every house gets electricity, just do it, get it done, that's it. And I, you know, that's my view on this whole fibre thing, just get it done. Thank you very much, Deputy. Um, I, I believe we've had a very productive uh, meeting here today. I want to thank the witnesses from Enterprise Ireland, from uh, 
Offaly Leo and the Chief Executive of Offaly County Council, Ken Tobin from HQ Tralee and Abu Do, uh, Do, Abu Do um, a very progressive um, company, um, private company. So um, we, we as a committee are putting together uh, a report in relation to remote working, smart working. Um, there's a lot of work um, in this area. There's a massive movement towards remote working uh, using co, uh, co, co working places. Um, I want to compliment Offaly County Council and wish you well in your conference uh, coming up on the 8th of March. Um, I'd like to thank you for communicating with our committee and for taking this opportunity for coming here today and for presenting so well. Um, I think there is need for coordination, collaboration, as Deputy Kenny has mentioned very well, um, and bringing together everyone on, on the one hymn sheet. There's many different ways to draw down funding, and Ken made reference to this, like Town and Village Renewal, or the, the, the fund that was there anyway with Enterprise Ireland, uh, the Rural Regeneration Programme. But there seems to be you know, a need for a more coordinated approach, and possibly is what um, Senator Coffey has said in relation to um, a national plan in relation to remote working. Um, and that should involve all different um, shareholders in this, like a private company, um, like Grow Remote were fantastic here the last day. And the work that they do on a voluntary basis, encouraging communities to set up uh, chapters. I attended one in my own local area in Clare and Clare Castle. Uh, there's a meeting tomorrow night in Ennis, and compliment everyone involved there. And from that, you know, you're you're, you're growing, and you can develop a, a shared working space that can work and address the issues that that uh, Debbie O'Keeve has raised in relation to congestion in Dublin, the need to rebalance our country, and. Um, you know, get away from commuting and the congestion and the stagnation in Dublin, uh, where there is a housing crisis. You know, and to areas uh, where there, there isn't that such demand. So, um, we, we are putting together a report. Um, our researcher is here today, uh, thankfully, and she's taken note. And we'd hope to be in a position to present a report. So, I'd like to thank you very much again, and we'll be in touch. And please feel free to stay in contact with the committee. Thanks again. Thank you. Just for two, two minutes. Two minutes. Thanks. Suspended for five minutes and uh, we'll resume in private session. Is that agreed? Agreed.